What's up? Today I'd love to share with you a single formula that allows you to understand chess easily and to find the right move easily in any position. For example, in the current position it is white to move. And if we think about it, we can see that there are opposite side castings, so white in general probably wish to attack the king, but at the moment it's not that clear how to do that. And what would you play here if you are white? Like, there are many options. You could take this knight, you can maybe develop your bishop one way or the other, Potentially you may wish to somehow use the h-file, stack rooks there, or do something else. Maybe you want to play a prophylactic move, king b1, which is useful in similar positions, and virtually any other move, right? There are so many options. So how do you choose the right one? Let me first explain to you the formula, because it's the universal one, and after that we'll come back to this position, and you will see how easy it is to find the right move when you know this formula. How do we know which piece is stronger in chess? How do we define that a knight is worth approximately 3 pawns and rook is approximately worth 5 pawns and queen is 9 or 10 pawns? All right? How do we know this? Well, we simply calculate the quantity of squares that a certain piece controls. Such as in this position, the knight controls 8 squares, while the rook controls 14, and therefore we know that the rook is stronger. However, the strength of a piece can also change depending on its location. Such as in this position, the white knight is still controlling 8 squares, while the black knight is only controlling 4 squares. And therefore, the white knight is 2 times stronger than the black knight. So the situation changes. Now white is stronger. And if we, in general, say that a knight is worth 3 pawns approximately, now if we take a look at the black knight, which only controls 4 squares, like if we again try to somehow evaluate it based on the pawn value, we could say that in order to control 4 squares, you only need 2 pawns, right? Just, just to illustrate, if I put two pawns right here, they'll control together four squares, right? So if we make that comparison, it means that currently the black knight is worth two pawns, not three pawns. Interesting, because that shows you how you can possibly outsmart your opponent, have a stronger army and defeat him. But there is also one more interesting idea here. Now let's have a look at this position. White's knight is still controlling eight squares, but... In addition to that, the knight is also taking away certain squares from the black knight. Thus, the black knight is only left with only two squares available. So if we start to compare the, the value of the black knight in pawns, we could say that currently it is worth only one pawn, because you only need one pawn to control two squares. So that's how we completely dominate here over the position, just because you've been smart about the way you put your pieces. Now, of course, this is just a training position, just to illustrate the concept, but this the very same idea will, apl will apply to any specific position that you play, right? So, that whole thing that I'm explaining to you right now is called activity. In simple words, that's the quantity of squares that your pieces control, and you want to increase your activity. So, the practical takeaway from this is that you do want to move your pieces forward so that they control more squares, which makes your pieces stronger, and at the very same time, they also start to take away certain squares from your opponent's pieces, therefore making them even weaker, and fundamentally, that's how you play a game of chess to win. Now, let's put this general concept to work. Let's come back to the position we talked about initially and try to apply these ideas so that we can see which move is better. All right, it's wide to move. It's actually the game between Benko against Nidorf, two of the famous players of the past. For example, do we want to take this knight on f4? On the one hand, there is certainly an upside of eliminating the active knight of your opponent that controls certain squares on your territory. So that would be an upside. But the downside is that as a result of this exchange, we actually open up this bishop, which now becomes way more active. We open up this rook, plus his knight from d7 now has an excellent square on e5, and from there it's going to attack a lot and put a lot of pressure on our position. And therefore, as a result of this operation, we eliminated one active piece of black, that knight that used to be on f4, but instead we activated three other pieces of black, and overall black is now controlling much more squares. So definitely that's not an exchange in our favor, and we certainly did not want to make that exchange. How about a move, let's say, uh, king to b1? Do we want to play that move? Like, in general, it is a little bit of a useful move to play, because the king will be a little bit better protected behind the pawns, but overall it does not help you to control more squares on the board. And therefore, it does not make sense to make this move unless you need to, unless your king is in danger. Currently it's not, so no need to waste time on this. How about a move rook to g1? Do we want to oppose our rook to his king? Like, it's a nice position for the rook overall, on a semi-open file, but the rook is quite active already. And therefore, if we relocate it here, it hardly makes it more active. So again, it does not allow us really to control more squares. Like, it actually controls more squares from h1, right here. 
and therefore we do not want to move it. You see how easily we can evaluate any move by simply deciding whether it allows us to become more active, control more squares on the board or not. If you want to develop the bishop, where should it go? Like, we've got four squares available. It's the same question. Like, what's the position of a bishop that will ensure for our bishop to control a greater quantity of squares? And with that in mind, Benko played bishop h3, because from here it controls the greatest quantity of squares possible. And so the bishop becomes most active. Now, because the bishop became so active, and it could possibly relocate somewhere here, Black got annoyed by the bishop and decided to trade it off. Which is probably not such a great idea, because this knight was the only asset of black, really, which was a lot of putting a lot of pressure here. And after they traded off, now they have only passive pieces left. Anyway, he played knight of eight. Although uh, black skin is a bit exposed, but his position is still very well defended and still not easy for white to break through. So, what do we do then? All the same stuff, right? We want to relocate our pieces onto more active positions where they control more squares. Now, rook is already active. So we can think about the remaining pieces. Our bishop from g3 just can't move really. I mean, we can move to h1, to h2, but it doesn't change anything. So we probably got to think about the rest of the pieces and relocate them to more active squares. So he played rook h1, stacking rooks along the h-file. By the way, it does not create any specific threats yet, because black is covering all these squares. But white is simply trying to increase the activity of his position, and that's the right thing to do. Black played here uh, knight to g6. Possibly he wants to move the other knight to f4. And now white still follows the same plan. He wants to take the pieces which are not doing much and relocate them to better squares. He played knight d1, aiming to relocate the knight to f5. If you remember we talked before that generally speaking we want to move forward, and if we can land our piece into opponent's half of the board, then not only our own piece will become very active, but it will also hamper your opponent and take away squares from him. So then you completely dominate the field and that's what you want, that's how you win. Black played rook c8, knight e3, rook c7, knight to f5. Now this monstrous knight is not only controlling a lot of squares, but is also putting a lot of pressure, taking away a lot of squares from black. The queen is now tied down to the defense of this weakness pawn on d6. So if we can land our knight there, that's just a monstrous knight. That's an octopus, that's great. Black played rook f8, he's still just trying to hold on. And now it's time for white to relocate the queen to a better square. Therefore he played queen d1. And he's seeking ways to somehow bring the queen over, possibly to the h file, and hopefully creating some checkmate and threats. Like played f6. And now it was white to, to move, and white could just relocate queen in a you know more calm way, but he decided to do it in a in, in the fastest way possible. So he played f4. He's willing to sacrifice a pawn just to bring the queen over immediately and start the attack. And it turns out that it actually is a good idea for white. Now white is actually threatening all kinds of things there, threatens the knight, black played knight e5, but after queen h7 he just resigned, because now it's checked to the king, if the king moves we can capture the bishop, check to the king, and if the king moves, um, let me actually ask you to think about this, let it be a puzzle of the day, so please think about this, what's the best way for white to win, and if you can find it, write it down in the comments below. I have a few other interesting follow-up videos which I'm planning to publish soon, so if you haven't subscribed yet, consider doing it right now to not miss out on future uploads. And if you want to know my system in greater details, I've got this free masterclass that you can access by clicking right there, and you will learn all the main positional principles of chess. Thank you very much for watching, keep crushing it!